What's going on guys? Tower number 9 here and today we have some more footage from Gen Con Day 2. This time it's going to be a match between Gavin from Holocron Gaming who was featured in our previous video uh, still playing Sabine ECL and on the right his opponent uh, Chris Schoenthal, my apologies if I mispronounced that last name, is playing double yellow boba so this should be an interesting matchup i think that traditionally speaking this is a uh this is a scenario that would favor the boba player but uh you know let's see what happens and see whether gavin can get the win Once again, big shout out to Ko Dameron for providing this footage. Uh, he took this footage himself over at Gen Con. And if you want to check out his channel, I have a link to it in the video description below. And I also have a link to the original footage from his extended stream, which is primarily player audio. Uh, I, I personally prefer videos with commentary, but if you like player audio, go check out Ko Dameron's video. Um, but yeah, huge shout out to him for getting this great footage uh, using his portable setup and also for um, and also for uh, allowing me to use it for this commentary. So this matchup is typically one that I think favors Boba Yellow. Um, we'll have to see how it uh, how it shakes out with the new uh, upgrades to Green Sabine, which has gotten a lot. Um, but Chris is going to lead off with the Mercenary Gunship, 2 cost 3-2, and it does have the ability for the opponent to steal it for 4 resources, but you can then steal it back. Uh, pretty good early start here for Chris, actually, because that unit is a major obstacle to space, and we see Gavin has a Green Squadron A-Wing in hand. Ouch. Yeah, Green Squadron A-Wing is a terrible start into this um, into this mercenary gunship because it will just uh, it will just get killed. So he actually opts to use his energy conversion lab to trade the Green Squadron A-Wing for the mercenary gunship. Not what you want to be doing as Sabine, but at least using the ECL prevented his opponent from killing that unit and uh, keeping his unit on the board. This is kind of an example of when you might want to have arena dodging as a tactic. Uh, I think Gavin is very behind from that start, and you know he may have made the best of a bad situation with the ECL play, but you really don't want to be using ECL that early, uh, in the, and on that sort of like light thing. You'd really rather have a higher impact play later on. However, uh, you know wasn't wasn't uh, how it how it shook out this game. We see uh, Toro Calican being played by Chris. And Gavin brings out the Fighters for Freedom. So Tora Calican is a 3 cost 3-5 three that uh, can deal 1 damage to another friendly Bounty Hunter unit when you play that unit to ready, which is kind of cool. And then the uh, Fighters for Freedom is a 3 cost 3-4, three so a little behind Toro on the stats front. But it has Saboteur, and when you play another red card, deal 1 damage to an enemy base. Uh, so... The damage to base there from Fighters for Freedom can be really impactful. Looks like Toro is going to swing into the base. So one of, the, one of the interesting dynamics in this is that the double yellow Boba deck can actually race Sabine. So most decks can't really race Sabine because she is normally considered, I think, the fastest leader. Uh, arguably Kylo Ren is faster now, but um, Sabine is very fast. And however, the double yellow Boba deck can race Sabine because it can use uh, its tempo tricks to disrupt Sabine's gameplay. Ooh, Gavin goes for a K2SO. That is not a card I usually want to be playing in this matchup as Sabine. It's too vulnerable to bounce. And that's exactly what we see. There's a waylay sending K2SO back to hand. And Boba exhausts there to ready a resource because an enemy unit left play. We'll see if Chris has a two cost thing to uh to play out but it looks like perhaps not um sabine swung to base but they don't seem to have marked it there should be there should be six damage here on chris's base three from the fighters for freedom uh and three from sabine actually there should be seven because fighters for freedom should have triggered on k2so so it should there should be seven damage there I'm not entirely sure why there isn't. And actually, now that I think about it, I think there's actually be 8 or 9 damage on the base because I believe, believe Sabine's uh, leader ability has been used twice. So I think maybe he's maybe he's taking notes or using an app or something. Unfortunately, it's not immediately visible here. Um, 
And I see in the uh, Twitch chat there, people were saying that the Boba player was tracking life on a uh, tracking his health on a notepad. Anyway, I believe there is there should currently be nine damage on Chris's base, assuming Gavin uh, did not miss the trigger for Fighters for Freedom, which is something that players do forget from time to time. Um, so Gavin has inflicted more damage, but Boba is going to deploy this turn, and Gavin's base has less health. So it could be a difficult situation here. Let's see... Three damage to the uh, three damage to the base there, so that should be, I believe, up to twelve. Chris, uh, Chris, thinking about what the next play is here. He can, of course, deploy Boba this turn. Looks like he has a. Um, Bodhi Rook, yeah, and that's what we see as the play. Bodhi Rook, so 3-3, three, three, uh, when played, you get to look at your opponent's hand and discard a non-unit card. He sees Cassian Andor, Fleet Lieutenant, uh, it's going to be the Darksaber. And you might be wondering why Gavin didn't play the Darksaber. I actually think that was quite prudent. Um playing the dark i mean you know you you can you could you could play it and just like make your opponent have to have it but the dark saber struggles in this uh in this matchup because of exhaust tech uh and bounce it's actually interesting though because in this scenario there isn't a no good to me dead in hand if he had played the dark saber i'm not actually sure there would have been a great answer Although I suppose it could have been uh it could have then led to Sabine being exhausted with cunning Fleet Lieutenant, uh, a Fleet Lieutenant arrives and sends the Fighters for Freedom in for 5 damage to base. And then Sabine Ren, Explosives Artist, played after Boba's deployment, dealing 1 damage to base with the Fighters for Freedom. So I believe... Um, I believe it's now, uh, there should now be 17 damage on Chris's base, so it was 9 earlier, then 3 from Sabine for 12, 5 for the Fleet Lieutenant, um, oh, should it be 18? 17 or 18, I think. Because of the Fighters for Freedom trigger. I think initiative's been taken here. Boba did remove the Fighters for Freedom, getting some resources back, which were then used to play Boba Fett Disintegrator. Let's see what happens next here. So... At this point, uh, Gavin has taken 8 damage to his base. Chris has taken substantially more, but Chris's board is better, and he has the uh, he has the double yellow uh, the double yellow disruption available. And Gavin has already used his ECL. If if Gavin had not used ECL already, we would be getting to the point where he could make some very impactful plays. You know, we could see, for instance, ECL wrecker. Um, ECL Wrecker could kill Boba, deal damage to the base, and de uh, defeat another unit at the same time. Uh, that could be very impactful, but because he had to use that ECL early on to, uh, in the situation with the mercenary gunship, things are looking a little different. Looks like there is a copy of Cunning in Chris's hand, which could be a huge reversal. Um, Cunning is a key card in this matchup. The ability to potentially exhaust two opposing units and uh, exhaust two opposing units and bounce another is just massive. And I do think it's likely that we're going to see Cunning play a role this turn. Let's see what happens here. Three damage to base from Sabine Ren, Explosives Artist. believe that should be now 20 uh, 20 damage or perhaps 21 damage Ch 
Chris considering his move. So one thing you can do with cunning is that you can give a plus four to one of your units in a like so he could play this here, exhaust Sabine and Fleet Lieutenant, give a plus four to one of his own units. And then he has three, six, nine, twelve damage on the board already, plus four would be sixteen damage. Um and the, and combined with the eight damage already on the board, that would leave Gavin on one HP. Um, that being said, there is the opportunity for counterplay if you go for the buff, because the buffed unit could potentially be killed. I think quite critically here, Gavin has Wrecker in hand, um, and Wrecker's uh, when played ability could defeat any unit on Chris's board. So if Chris does go for the cunning buff, Gavin does have an answer that will remove the buffed unit before it gets a chance to attack. Um, four resources, cunning. Exhaust, exhaust, buff. And it's going to be a buff on Toro, which is potentially crucial because Toro could swing again if another bounty hunter is played. I think Gavin's play has got to be Wrecker to kill Toro before he swings with that buff. Poe Dameron is in hand, but without ambush isn't going to be relevant. K2 is in hand, but isn't enough. I think it's got to be Wrecker here. Wrecker and get rid of a resource. Um, if he has a timely intervention in Smuggle, he could ambush in. Uh, he could then ambush in K2. Um, but I'm not sure that would be. Oh, timely intervention. He's going for the K2 play. And I think that's a game losing play from Gavin. Uh, I could be wrong, but not dealing. I think he. I think he. Uh, I think he is going to die to the buffed Toro Calican, potentially swinging twice in a turn here. I don't think you can afford to let that go against this deck. Um, we'll have to see. But there is seven damage from Toro plus uh, another six from Boba and uh, and Bodhi. So that would be 13 damage, which would, uh, in combination with the 8 damage already there, leave Gavin at 4 HP. But because Toro is going to be able to defeat Greedo and stand up and make another attack, that's going to be the game. I could be wrong, but I think, I think that's how this is going to play out. Um... Now, of course, Gavin may well not have known that there is that uh, there is that bounty hunter to stand up uh, in hand, but uh, Chris shows Greedo and the Toro ready play, and Gavin scoops rather than have it get played out. Um, so Toro would have won on the next attack anyway. I think Gavin might have had a chance had he used uh, had he used Wrecker from hand to kill Toro immediately. Uh, the incoming damage would be significantly mitigated, but I think it would still be um, it would still be a dangerous situation, and he would not have been able to ambush Wrecker because he had, did not have ECL, uh, and the heroic or the timely intervention would be too expensive. So he would only get the when play at five damage. He would not be able to also take out Boba, but having Boba, small Boba and um, having Boba, small Boba and Bodhi swing for a total of 10 damage is a lot better than the multiple buffed swings from Toro plus the other smaller units. So unfortunate, uh, unfortunate scenario for Gavin. He really was in a difficult position from the start when his only opening unit was a green squadron A-wing into a mercenary gunship off initiative. That is a very bad position to be in. And, uh, he, you know, he, he used the ECL early to avoid, uh, to avoid losing control immediately, but ultimately, uh, ultimately ended up in trouble in the mid game. Let's see whether or not Dav Gavin can do better in the second round here. Um, the players are sideboarding right now, and one thing I'll say is that the, um, the Boba Yellow deck, so this is a deck, uh, I think that Loopy from Late Night Gaming was kind of an initial champion of this build. I remember talking to him about it and actually being very skeptical of it at that time. This was, uh, this was earlier on in the, um, earlier on in the Spark of Rebellion meta, and my thought was that it wasn't competitively valid because it just lost too hard to Boba Green. And I remember saying later, you know, if anyone can come up with a Boba Yellow that doesn't have a horrible matchup against Boba Green, 
then, you know, maybe things are going to be different. Uh, and, you know, Loopy was a partisan of that deck for some time. But I know that uh, KTOD came out with a version of it that was quite popular. I think uh, Mike from KTOD, a.k.a. Bobby Sapphire, had some uh, had some very good success with that. And it, and it ended up being a big deck during the later phases of the uh, Star Showdown season. I think it was... Uh, and I don't even remember the timing. It might have been out at the start of that season. Um, I don't remember exactly when it uh, it was it was first released, but I think the KTOD version of that really popularized it. Um, and it was a uh, yeah, it was it was a it made a big impact. I think that uh, going into set two, we also saw a bunch of cards that are good for it. I'm not sure that people have come to an exact final analysis of which of those cards need to go in, but there are a bunch of new cards that seem quite relevant. You know, you're looking at things like a new adventure, uh, Boba Fett's armor, Four Lom and Zuckus, um, Doctor Evazan. That's a very controversial one because Doctor Evazan is very high risk, high reward. Um, the there is the chance of just getting horribly blown out. Maybe we'll see that if Chris is playing Evazon. Um, there, uh, fighters for freedom ambush off ECL to kill Evazon and get your resources back is a uh, unfortunate play for the Evazon player. I guess we'll we'll see whether or not that ends up uh, ends up coming to pass in this uh, in this next game, but. Yeah, anyway, uh, Boba, Boba Yellow was uh, overshadowed by Boba Green at first, but ultimately ended up actually doing better than it once some uh, more refined builds came out. And uh, so, yeah, shout out to Loopy from from uh, Loopy from Late Night Gaming for believing in the deck when, uh, when I at least didn't. And uh, shout out to KTOD for... Uh, refining and uh, refining and popularizing it in a version that was very successful. All right, so now we're going to uh, we're going to see what happens here in the um, we're going to see what happens next. Also, if I have any of that history wrong, my humble apologies. Uh, I that that is my impression at the current moment, but I could be wrong. Um, and it looks like we are going to. Uh, it looks like after some involved uh, sideboarding and some resourcing choices. Uh, we are going to be moving into game two. Uh, Gavin is, I think, has resourced one card and is thinking about the second one. Um, I do think that you want uh, Sabine Ran Explosives Artist as a very good opening play in this matchup because if the opponent's opening play is a Greedo or a Crafty Smuggler, Sabine gets to kill both of those units while remaining alive thanks to her on attack ability. She can either deal one damage to Greedo and just defeat him immediately and maybe take two damage back if he hits his top deck or against the Crafty Smuggler. You can attack. The on attack ability will deal one damage to the Smuggler, disabling its shield, and then two damage from Sabine will finish the job and she will only take two damage in return leaving her alive with one hp so sabine ran i think sabine ran explosives artist is probably the most desirable opening play in this matchup for the uh for gavin and uh and there and there she is he has he has that play and it does look from chris's hand like chris's opening play is greedo so we're going to see just the scenario that i was just discussing where uh, Sabine's on attack ability potentially allows her to take out Greedo and either take no damage or take just two damage in return and stay on the board, depending on whether or not uh, Chris hits his top deck. Now, of course, Gavin might play it aggressively instead and go for the base, but no, he goes, uh, goes to remove Greedo, which I personally think is the correct play. Is Chris going to go for the top deck here? No, what... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so it looks like Chris was putting damage on his base, which was not correct there. And it looks like he it looks like he didn't go for the Greedo top deck. It just didn't didn't do it at all. I'm not entirely sure why. Uh he plays Boba Fett Disintegrator. So I guess Boba can swing into Sabine and kill her in one hit, uh top deck or no top deck. Gavin is thinking now about what his play is. He has a few options, so at the very least, he could either play Cassian Andor here, or the um, he could either play Cassian Andor, or he could play uh, Red Three. Cassian Andor in this case would be a three cost three five. Red Three would be a three cost two three that offers a nice raid one uh, to his other units uh, or his other heroism units, while also having raid one itself. Chris is going to take the initiative. I suspect we're going to see this turn leading off with Boba Fett taking out uh, Sabine. 
Um, and uh, Gavin uses Sabine's leader ability for one damage to each base. We do see a cunning in Chris's hand. This is a very crucial card for this matchup, and I think it's likely going to play a big role. But we'll have to see exactly how that uh, how that breaks down. There is also a Bodhi Rook there. Last game, Bodhi Rook disabled a Dark Saber from hand. We might see uh, we might see him in play again. Looks like Gavin is going to resource Cassian Andor, which does give him a strong smuggle option later on. So Cassian is a three cost three five, but you can uh, you can play him via smuggle for five, and if you do so, then he comes into play ready. So in this case, Gavin opting to resource Cassian and potentially bring him in later for more value. Doesn't look like he has a very uh, particularly amazing hand here. Uh, I think, you know, maybe we're going to see just a fleet lieutenant to send Sabine in. Uh, and there is a heroic intervention, but they don't think it's going to be there for long because Bodhi Rook is the play and he gets to discard a non-unit card. The only non-unit card in that hand is the heroic intervention. Um, and we do now see also that Gavin has a Poe Dameron in hand. He could also bring out Bright Hope. So the one play to do would be, uh, you know, use Sabine's ability, play Sabine, Fleet Lieutenant Sabine into the base for five. Another play would be to instead bring out Bright Hope, uh, thus uh, p providing an obstacle in space and giving Red 3 some cover. Not entirely sure, though. Sabine deploys here. Let's see what happens here. It's going to be the straight attack, which makes me think it. we are going to see... Bra oh, no. Oh, okay. So Sabine actually used here to kill Boba? Yeah, so Sabine has uh, raid one from Boba from uh, the red three and swings in to kill Boba Fett Disintegrator and do one damage to base. A bit of a bit of a surprising play, um, because it does mean that Bodhi can just kill Sabine and remain alive. I'm not I'm not sure I love it, but you know I I, I don't know. I, I mean I don't think it's I don't think it's totally totally outrageous or whatever. But I think I might have just gone for the base there in that situation. Let's see what happens next. I do think Chris has a high likelihood of swinging Bodhi in there. Um, the bright hope in space is interesting. It does obstruct a potential Fett's fire spray. Um, and it can swing for two and is difficult to remove with the six HP. Um, it is, however, vulnerable to being bounced. So, for instance, Chris here could play Cunning, exhaust Red 3 and Sabine, and bounce Bright Hope which would leave Gavin in a somewhat uh, unfortunate position. Now, on the other hand, Gavin does have Poe Dameron in hand and could ambush it in to defeat Boba. We are going to see Cunning, and it's just the play that I was discussing. Exhaust, exhaust, bounce. So Gavin's now in a bit of a spot because if he wants to ambush Boba with Poe, at this point he has to just uh, he has to pass into Boba. Um, and it makes it kind of obvious what he's doing. On the other hand, he he passes. Okay, so Chris should be on a lookout here, knowing that there, that this could be a uh, Poe Dameron ambush, which can kill Boba in one hit on deployment. So one thing to do here is Chris would be to have Bodhi take out Sabine before taking any other action. Um see if Gavin keeps passing. Another option for Gavin would have been to like play K2 here or something and then try to take out Boba next turn. Um, but it, but that play would be vulnerable if there were another bounce piece in hand because Chris could potentially attack with Boba, get the two resources back, and then bounce K2, which would leave Gavin in a very unfortunate position. I think he's trying to guard against Boba with the uh, Poe Dameron ambush here. Chris thinking it over. 
Now, Chris could just take the initiative and end the turn here. Um, I'm not sure it would be... I'm not sure how good it would be because I, I think at the very least, if your plan is to just uh, is to just go ahead and not deploy Boba, I think it's probably worth it to have Bodhi take out Sabine here. Just get that one unit off the field, and then if Gavin passes again, maybe you claim at that point. But we'll have to see. Boba deploys. Okay, Boba deploys right into Poe Dameron. Uh, yeah, I think I think in I think a, maybe a bit of a misplay from Chris. I think it would have been better to swing with Bodhi first, but I don't know. Maybe he did it this way on purpose so that Bodhi can trade with Poe. Um, so yeah, by doing it this way. Now the funny part is Poe actually is hitting for seven here thanks to red three, so he doesn't need to discard a card for damage, although he might still want to discard a card to do damage to the base here. Uh, discarding a card for damage to base here seems pretty reasonable, but it looks like he decides not to do it, and then Bodhi is going to trade with Poe. Okay, and initiative taken by Gavin. The um yeah, I think it might have been better for, for Chris to have Bodhi swing and kill Sabine remaining alive. I guess in that case, maybe maybe Gavin would use Poe's ability to kill Bodhi. He could use the on attack and discard a card to deal two damage. Yeah, it's interesting. Not entirely sure what I think the what I think the best play there is. But the uh, the Poe Dameron ambush is definitely a welcome uh, welcome play for Gavin and has left him. He has the initiative. He has um, he has so he has the initiative. He has the board state and he has an advantage on HP. But double yellow Boba is a quite serious deck and let's see what uh, Chris can do to try and make a comeback here. It does look like there's a Fett's Fire Spray in hand. Uh, that would potentially allow Red 3 to be to be removed this turn. The problem is by playing it, Red 3 still does get a chance to attack for 3 damage. And then Gavin could quite probably get the initiative. We do also see a Fur Cause, I believe, in in hand. Actually, there might be two of those in hand. I'm not sure. For a cause I believe in is a crucial card for closing out games once your opponent has stabilized the board, and we might well see it relevant here. Fett's Fire Spray hits the field. Red 3 quickly swings on in, I think. Oh, he's looking at his cards in hand. Three resource for a cause. Okay. Maximum damage there, 4 damage off 4 cause. I'm very surprised that he didn't swing with red 3 for the guaranteed 3 damage. I, I think maybe what he's trying to do with this play, though, is I think maybe he's trying to get Fett's Fire Spray to attack into red 3. And if he can get Fett's Fire Spray to attack into red 3, it slows down Chris's position in the race. Um... I'm not altogether sure, though. I think, personally, I would have taken the attack with Red 3, and I think very likely Chris would still want to attack into Red 3 in this scenario because he's significantly behind and would want to uh, would want to, to try and uh, get control of the board rather than racing. I could be wrong, but I think that way you probably get 3 more damage this turn because you get to swing with red 3 and then you can still play your fur cause I believe in afterwards. Now that being said, uh, if he plays for a cause I believe in after Fett's Fire Spray swings, he does lose the initiative. So maybe he's trying to retain initiative here. Um, and it looks like he discards everything that he sees other than a copy of Rebel Assault there. And the copy of Rebel Assault will come in handy here by allowing him to attack with both Sabine and the Fleet Lieutenant at plus one at the start of the next turn. Unless Chris takes the initiative here. And if Chris takes the initiative here instead of swinging with the Fire Spray, Red 3 gets to swing for three. So Fett's Fire Spray indeed takes the swing on Red 3. Gavin takes the initiative and he will be able to lead off this turn with that Rebel Assault and uh, by that method deal 8 damage to base which is a pretty heavy hit and he'll be able to do that without Chris having any chance to interact with those units so that seems like a pretty good situation for Gavin
and then um I think he I think he does have Okay, there we go. So that's going to be Rebel Assault, 8 damage to the base, and he still has, I believe, uh, I think he stopped resourcing, so he has 5 resources left. We could uh, we could see a... Um, we could see Cassian Andor uh, from Smuggle, uh, which would then allow another swing for 3. It looks like there isn't another copy of For a Cause, I believe, in in hand. I had thought perhaps there was, but it looks like there isn't. And that does seem relevant to what other options uh, he has for reach. Chris's base has taken 24 damage, only 6 HP left for Chris. Another Rebel Assault like that could end the game. A, It looks like we have the... Uh, what are those guys called, anyway? The 5 cost 5-4 five, ambush unit. Uh, <laughs> Syndicate Lackeys, I believe, is the title of that card. Syndicate Lackeys. And the uh, Syndicate Lackeys ambush in and defeat Sabine, taking 2 damage in return. And there are still 3 resources. So there is a K2 in hand, but it's risky here because it could just get bounced. But he does go for the K2. He has one other resource which he isn't going to be able to spend. Now K2 is in a nice spot because if he if K2 were to be defeated, it would be oh initiative is just taken here. So I think what we're likely going to see is the cunning uh, in Chris's hand used to bounce K2. Uh, if K2 is defeated, it does three direct damage to base without really much counterplay. Gavin has an unfortunate hand there. It looks like he has three copies of Green Squadron A-Wing. He would probably prefer to have zero copies of Green Squadron A-Wing at this time, quite frankly. Um, on the other hand, he could at least play them and maybe force that Fire Spray to interact with them. There is 10 damage on the board now for Chris, and if he plays the Cunning, it could potentially be up to 14, though I think it's risky to let any unit on uh, on the board get an attack here because just one attack plus a copy of um just one attack plus a copy of for a cause could be the game i think this has got to be a cunning to bounce k2 and probably exhaust the fleet lieutenant as well let's see what happens here chris exhausts four resources there's the cunning He goes for the exhaust. Exhaust and buff. He might be trying to go to a racing game plan here. So now uh, plus four on that Syndicate Lackeys can swing for nine damage plus another five from Fett's Fire Spray. So that's going to be a total of uh, 14 damage, which would be six, uh, 16 total damage. And maybe there's some trick to get extra damage in hand, although it doesn't look like it. Cassian Andor smuggled onto the field, and because he is played with Smuggle, he comes into play ready. Three resources for... Uh... Okay, I don't know why... Forlom ambushes Cassian... I, it looks like he only exhausted three resources for that, and I think it should cost four, but maybe some of these things are stacked... Uh, Cassian Andor is still alive. So basically he has two main options here. One is to go for the base, but he doesn't do it. He goes for the syndicate lackeys. I think, I think going for the base might be better. Like, yeah, the lackeys swing for nine. It looks like Chris is actually just going to scoop though. So I guess it was a, I guess it was a winning play either way. Ultimately, um, in that game, I think Gavin got far higher value out of his energy conversion lab, ambushing in Poe to defeat Boba without Boba getting a chance to attack and therefore not getting to ready two resources, losing a lot of tempo for Chris. Um, Gavin was able to, uh, was able to get the win. So... We're going to go to game three here in the uh, in this Sabine versus Boba matchup. And we'll have to see how this goes. Syndicate Lackeys is an interesting card. I think in the first set, um, people often played Bosk instead of it. I think Bosk has been kind of overshadowed 
by um bosk has been kind of overshadowed by four Lom, in my opinion syndicate lackeys does have some advantages being strength five does mean that that syndicate lackeys can ambush and defeat sabine wren uh the leader in one hit which is a nice little uh nice little facet to have also the five four profile can take out a unit like boba fett uh disintegrator or toro calican uh or some of the other uh three five units that are now prevalent in the game um, so it could be that the Syndicate Lackeys is actually better positioned now than it was previously, thanks to its direct competitor Bosk being overshadowed, and thanks to an increase in number of 5 HP units, thanks to things like Cassian Andor for the 3-5, and um, so Cassian Andor at 3-5, uh, and the uh, you know Liberated Slaves is 3-5, DJ is 3-5, Toro is 3-5, the 3-5 the, the stat line was previously only found at three resources on Boba Fett Disintegrator, but has really proliferated in set two. And so maybe that 5-4 Syndicate Lackey's profile is looking better. I do think that Gavin might have been better off swinging for the base instead of killing the Syndicate Lackeys there because he would then leave the base on 3 HP, which would actually mean that Chris would need to claim immediately unless he could somehow win the game that turn because an attack from any of Gavin's three units would then close the game. Um, so you would still end up nullifying the buffed Syndicate Lackey's attack, but um, I don't know. Maybe he was... Was he worried about a new adventure or something? I'm not sure that... I'm not sure Chris had the resources for that. And I'm actually not even sure it would win the game because he he could do... If you use a new adventure on the buffed unit, it loses the buff. He could use it on... He could, if he had a new adventure, he could have used and, and had the resources to play it. He could have used it on Fett's Fire Spray, which would then allow Fett's Fire Spray to ready because it comes into play ready. Oh, and you know what? Uh, the um, yeah, that would. I think that would still not be enough damage, though. I could be wrong. I'd, I'd have to. I have to go back and look at it again. I think that would be a total of 17 damage, which would actually not be enough at that phase because Gavin's base was barely damaged. But I could be wrong. And, uh, you know, just defeating the unit was, uh, you know, was still a winning move for Gavin, giving Chris, given Chris's concession there. So, you know, you can't, can't necessarily be too critical. I'll also say this is round five of day two of a big tournament. And, uh, it's very possible that the players are a little frazzled and potentially even stressed at being on stream. One thing, um, that you get used to if you go to a bunch of these events is, uh, being on stream, which I think some people find exciting and energizing, but some people find it to be difficult and pressure and cause them to be, and it can cause them to be more likely to make errors. Don't know what the case is for these players necessarily in this match, but that's something to consider. I think sometimes, uh, sometimes spectators can be very harsh. Um, and I think it's worth saying, hey, you know, uh, the people who are actually out there playing the game and uh, have been playing a bunch of other games this day and potentially previous days and so on, uh, you know, they they have some factors that makes it uh, that makes it a little a uh, little more difficult for them than just an average, uh, you know, just an average organized play kit event at the local store. All right, let's see uh, Let's see what happens as we go into round three. Chris plays out the Mercenary Gunship. This was a winning start for him in round one. Man. Gavin once again forced to do the ECL ambush on that on with a Green Squadron A-Wing into that Mercenary Gunship. This is looking like a bad start for him as this is just the way the game began that led to his loss in round one. A shame that he, a shame for Gavin that he did not have an arena dodging option there. Interestingly, it looks like he may have resourced a for a cause I believe in. Okay, you know maybe he's thinking this matchup is fast enough that that's not going to be relevant here. Boba Fett disintegrator on the field. Cassian on the field. Both players with a three five. Initiative taken. One damage to each base from Sabine. I think Gavin's substantially behind with this opening, but we'll see how things pan out. Let's see here.
All right. Let's see if Gavin can do something to make a comeback here. Uh, ooh, ouch. That's a tough play. So we see a Cartel Spacer played, which exhausts Cassian, and that means that now Boba Disintegrator is going to be able to defeat Cassian in one shot. Not where you want to be as, as the uh, Sabine player here. One key factor that um, that might uh, that might be in Gavin's favor, though, is that we have yet to see. I believe we have yet to see a copy of Cunning. That is a crucial card for this matchup, and I don't think we've seen one in Chris's hand this time. Unlike in the previous matches, uh, Gavin deploys Sabine. Bodhi Rook. If there was a dark saber, there isn't going to be one anymore. Wow. For a cause, Metal Ceremony, Rebel Assault, and a Fleet Lieutenant. The Fleet Lieutenant can't be removed, but any of those other cards could. I think the... Man, this is this is a very bad place for Gavin. Um, I think Fleet Lieutenant into Sabine and then play Metal Ceremony is probably his best play for this turn. Um, I don't know that it's necessarily a great play. Yeah, so Chris opts to remove the Metal Ceremony, which I, which I think is pretty reasonable. So if you put the Metal Ceremony on Sabine uh, at 3 attack, Bodhi can't attack into her and live. Um, man, Gavin is, Gavin's in a rough spot here. I Okay, doesn't play the Fleet Lieutenant, uh, opts to kill Boba and play for a cause. I think... So for a cause is typically a card that you want to play in a very different situation to this one. It's normally something that you want to be using later in the game. Uh, the problem is that it's a card that uses a bunch of resources and does not advance your game state at all. Like it doesn't advance your board. It just does direct damage. So you're trying. It's best to use that card in a situation where you're closing out the game. Um, and this was, you know, this was not one of those situations. It seems like Gavin put a high priority on defeating his opponent's Boba. So using the Fleet Lieutenant would have not yielded any extra, actual extra damage. I'm a little surprised this was the play instead of Fleet Lieutenant Sabine into the base. Uh, looks like he keeps K2 and Poe and returns and discards a Green Squadron A-Wing. And I think the other one was a Fighters for Freedom. Um, I don't know... I don't know that K2 and Poe are going to be able to get much of a result here, though, because ECL has already been used. If ECL hadn't been used, those cards would be a lot more exciting than they are now. But maybe there's going to be a maybe there's going to be a timely intervention. Let's see what happens here. I do think Chris made a good call to discard the metal ceremony there. I think that was probably the best of the events in hand under the circumstances, but the um, I'm surprised Gavin didn't go for the fleet lieutenant. Um, and now Bodhi clears Sabine. That's the other thing about the fleet lieutenant play. It would put you in a position where Sabine can't be killed in one hit. So I guess the only real thing Gavin can do is throw down one of his big units and just hope to uh, hope to not get bounced. Was that a pass? What, what, what was that? Gamorrean guards are played. So you gotta. I think you just have to. I think you have to just play Poe here. Okay. Yep. Just play. Po, just plays Poe. Poe at least can't be bounced by Cunning because his power is too high. But if there's a Waylay, it could bounce him or a Cantina bouncer. Both would be big problems. Um. Boba deploys. Initiative taken, Boba into base, and then the Spacer into base. So Gavin now far behind in the race. He does have Poe on the field. So Poe can Poe Poe Dameron's a very good card. So I will say that. So Poe can attack into the Gamorrean guards, defeat them, use his on attack ability to deal two damage to Bodhi at the same time, get a two for one, and remain on the board. Um, and so that's, that's a good play, but I don't think it's a good enough play. 
because at this point we're that still leaves Gavin staring down six more damage this turn, which would leave him on only uh, only 10 HP. And that's if Chris has no surprise strike, no fire spray, nothing else to add damage. And in fact, Chris has two copies of Cunning and a Fett's fire spray. So I think this game is all but over, uh, barring some kind of big misplay. We'll have to see what happens. So Poe's got to go uh, attack the uh, Gamoran guards. They they are 4-4 with conditional Sentinel. They have Sentinel as long as a cunning unit is in play. Um, and so as long as another cunning unit is in play on your side of the board. Uh, and so that's got to be the main target for the attack. And then the on attack ability to do two damage should probably be used here to clear Bodhi Rook. Um, but I don't think that's enough. Gavin, uh, thinking about what to discard, ends up discarding K2, 2 damage to Bodhi, and then the uh, the 6 damage swing from Poe, taking out the 4 HP Gamorrean Guards. Gamorrean Guards do hit Poe back for 4, but now I think it's time for Chris to step on the gas here and just go straight for the base and cl probably close this game out. Um, he can do 6 damage already. That's uh, That puts Gavin at 15 on base. He has a Fett's Fire Spray in hand. That could put Gavin to 20 on base, and then it's just one attack to win the game. Um, I don't think Gavin has much of a reply there. However, we'll have to see what happens. The thing is, with a 30 HP base and only having taken 7 damage so far, Gavin has to take so many actions to win the game at this point. Uh, I think I think Chris is far ahead. Now, he could have Boba kill Poe. That's the more conservative defensive play. Nope, he's going for the base, and I think that's a good move by Chris. Just going for the... Uh, going there is a... Um, going there is a better way to play it, I think. Gavin thinking over his options, but doesn't necessarily have a lot. Cassian Andor on the field. Two more to base. 15 damage on base, and I think we're going to see if it's fire spray, and I think there's not going to be a lot, uh, not going to be a lot for Chris for Gavin to do after that. There's Fett's fire spray initiative taken. Five damage to base, only five HP left, and so you know, uh, I don't, I don't even know if there's anything in, that Gavin could have here that would stop the Fett's fire spray. You know, he could do like a rebel assault. You know, if he does a if he does a rebel assault, he gets to do what eight damage, nine damage. It's not not anywhere near enough. Um, I think that this game and game one, we both saw a, we saw in both cases a very very unfavorable start for Gavin. Um, that green squadron A wing is your only starting unit when going second is uh, it's definitely a punishable opening. And Chris had the mercenary gunship that he needed to punish it. Um, Gavin using the ECL there may have at least prevented the mercenary gunship from killing the A-Wing and remaining alive, but it lost him access to ECL later on. ECL was critical uh, later on in the second game, allowing Poe to ambush Boba and take him out. And, uh, you know, not having that in these games is, is tough. So, you know, I think this, I think this match is, you know, in some ways kind of an advertisement for arena dodging. So, uh, arena dodging is a tactic where you try to have a unit in hand for both, that is a turn one play for both ground and space. And then you go to the arena that your opponent is not in. It is a good tactic for aggro decks. And I think if that option had been available for Gavin um, in uh, either of those games, they might have had a very different outcome. But that uh, ECL ambush Green Squadron A-Wing into the Mercenary Gunship line of play, I think, is very unfavorable. Uh, very unfavorable for the Sabine player. So, yeah, tough tough situation for Gavin. Um the funny thing is that actually an Alliance X-Wing, which is just a 2-3, would be better than the Green Squadron A-Wing in that scenario because if you play the Alliance X-Wing, uh, you don't have to ECL it because if the Mercenary Gunship attacks into it, it's just a trade. Whereas the problem with the Green Squadron A-Wing is that it's a 1-3 with Raid 2. You play a 1-3, they have a 3-2. They just attack into you and defeat you because your raid isn't relevant unless you're attacking. So Gavin needed to use ECL to make that a trade instead of his unit just getting picked off. 
but it wasn't really a great use of it. So there is uh, there is Co Dameron uh, giving some giving some comments or whatever after the match, and uh, that's gonna that's gonna do it for this one. But uh, yeah, so shout out to uh, shout out to this guy on the screen here, Co Dameron, for uh, for getting this gr- great footage from Gen Con and for allowing me to use it for these. We we still have uh, we still have some more Gen Con match commentary on the way. Thanks again for watching, guys. Be sure to check out the uh, be sure to check out Co Dameron's channel linked in the video description below. And yeah, I'll catch you guys later.